Hey everyone, welcome back to another edition of the highlights from 2023 from the Innovators Mindset podcast. It is lovely for you to be here. This is the second episode of this and great guests as always. I, I always think about how lucky I am that people agree to spend their time with me. People are so inundated and so overwhelmed with work. And one of the things I'm really proud of with this podcast is there is no prep time. There is no, there's prep time for me. I try to read up and learn about my guests, but for the guests, uh, I know people are really busy and these are typically educators, people in the education profession. So I basically send them three questions I'm going to ask them and really don't really, I, a lot of times I don't even send the questions because they're, they usually roll off the tongue and I want really kind of authentic stories. Um, but it's really conversational and, and, the process that I do for the podcast is all I ask of them is to spend about 90 minutes with me, but we only record for maybe 30 to 45 minutes or so for each one. And the time we spend before the podcast, I just have conversations with them, just kind of get to know them, you know, ask them if there's anything they'd like to share, anything they'd like to promote. You know, I feel like a little, you know, Johnny Carson show. <laughs> I'm rich and Johnny Carson, not like someone, I don't know, Jimmy Fallon. Is that? It's still a thing. And so uh, I really want to give people the opportunity to share their best stuff and to share the things they want to get out to the world, but do it in a really authentic way. So I just kind of have like this space where we kind of connect and, and share. And I, I just feel really, really blessed. And I, I talk about all this because the theme of today's episode is really thinking about reflection. And this to me is probably one of the most important things I do. I am someone who always focuses on really where we need to go, what we need to do to get better and how we need to grow. And the best way to do that is by looking back and focusing on what could we have done differently? What could we have, um, you know, grown from in the process? And you, you can't really move toward the future if you do not have make time to just kind of reflect on the past and it was just it was interesting uh someone reached out to me uh is actually teachers on fire podcast and he talked about one of the things that i used to do as an administrator was i embedded time into professional learning days where my staff actually uh, could go into their classrooms and block and reflect and i actually built that time into the school days and ask them to do it after school i didn't ask them to do it on their own time I saw reflection as a really important part of what we do as educators. And when people say that I don't have time to reflect, to me, that's then you don't really have time to learn. And so if it's important to a school, to an organization, for people to move forward and to come up with those ideas, we have to be able to take the time and to look back. So I wanted to share with you, before we get into these wonderful guests who are probably going to have way better things to say than I ever will, uh, some ideas for reflection. And I actually found an old blog post. This is one of the things I love about blogging. I actually, uh, uh, you can just Google my own name and find something on this. And I, you know, I was kind of looking back and, you know, it's kind of reflecting and I, it gives me a chance to reflection, to reflect on my reflections, which is a weird thing. It's like an inception, right? So I, I wrote this post and I'll, and I'll connect it in the description down below. Uh, four reflection qu questions for the end of the school year. Now, it's not the end of the school year. It's probably, the end. well, actually, if you're in Australia, and shout out to my um, Australian friends and, you know, people who are finishing the school year that listen in uh, different countries than our own. <laughs> so the air horn is not as good if I don't laugh that I play the air horn because I have to do that <laughs> laugh. Anyways, so I, I wrote this post and um, I'm going to look at the questions, but I'm not going to read what I wrote. So I'm going to see what I come off the top of my head. And so these are four questions I have at the, at the school year, and I'm going to modify them a little bit for the sake of this uh, opening of this podcast. And the first one is what I do well this year. Uh, I, I struggled with, should I do this first or should I do this second? Because I think a lot of times we, we tend to um, focus on the things we do well, and then we get into the things we did wrong. And it kind of leaves you with a crappy feeling. But really kind of starting with strengths, you can interchange these two questions, really starting with, you know, what am I really proud of? And this is something I think is a big realization for me this year is I am so quick to commend other people and just to 
hammer myself and never feel I'm doing things good enough. And just to take time and say, you know what? I'm really proud of this accomplishment. I'm proud of when I'll give you a, a real example. I just had a terrible hamstring strain and I, I really have been reflecting that this is just a blip. This is just a moment. And I don't think I would have done this if you like, I'm like, Oh, everything is in this moment right now. Uh, you know, when you, sometimes you get sick and you're like, this is who I am. And that's sometimes how I've gotten this way. And now kind of getting through this hamstring injury, it's like, okay, what am I going to do here that I've caused this or this issue has been happened. And it sounds like, is it, am I really focusing on my strengths or not? I am just give me a second. So <laughs> One of the things that, you know, when I heard this, I'm like, hey, this is a moment. What I'm going to do here to make myself better. And so I've been actually implementing uh, stretching, doing things I, I actually have fought for years not to do. And it's really helped me grow. And after the injury, I'm going to continue these things to be proactive instead of reactive to doing this. So what I've gotten better at when I'm really proud of this this year is when things have gone wrong for me that I've said, this is a moment, learn from it, do something better with it so you can continuously get better moving forward. That's one of the things I'm really proud of. And you know, what I'd love to do if you in the comments share something you're proud of in the comments. I love to hear from you. No one ever talks to me. No one ever comments, whatever. Just talk into a camera. Nobody cares. Uh, I would love to hear from you. What's something you're really proud of from this last year? And I think that's a really great place to start. Um, but the second question is, where do I need to grow? And th there's this is this is sometimes seen as like a, a negative, but we can all get better. And when we look at where we need to grow, it, it pushes up, pushes us. And I was just reading over my um, the, the course I teach with University of Pennsylvania, and it's really amazing because I really encourage people to do reflections and to really share authentic things that, that not only have connections to the course, but more importantly, connections to the work they currently do. And I learned a ton. But a lot of the students in the class, they're really saying like, you know, I could do this better. I can do this better. And I think it says something to the people you serve because this is not, you know, these are administrators, these are teachers, these are superintendents, principals. And when we're asking people to continuously get better in education, which is the point, right? The point is to help people grow. If students show up to our class and they know everything, what's the point? The point is to help people get better. And that that's always about growth. And what I find really valuable is that when you take that time to share, here are the things I'm struggling with. Here's where I'm trying to get better. It, it kind of just opens up a door for everyone else. One of the things I suggest to people attending my sessions, to my attending my keynotes, especially administrators, I say, if there's something you're struggling with today, I want you to go back and tell your staff that you're struggling with it. And this is what you're going to do because of that struggle. Because they often only see the end result of things, not the process. And sharing that process of where we need to grow, I think is, is really, really powerful. So the first question, go back. What did I do well this year? The second is, where do I need to grow? Um, the third thing, what things will I challenge myself with in the next year? I love this one and I'm always trying to look and revamp and I'm not a big resolution guy. In fact, I, I take pride that typically when I start something new, I don't wait till January. I always start in like November or December because I want momentum. I want kind of a build up to that. And if you have the momentum, it really kind of helps you as everyone else is trying their resolutions January 1st. And here's what I mean by that. If you commit to going to the gym on January 1st, you know, of the new year, and great. If you're doing that, that's awesome. But a lot of people get really frustrated because everyone else did that at the same time. So it's harder to get on machines. It's harder to get in that space. And so when you're just kind of starting off, that frustration of not being able to do some of the things that you want to do because it's just so busy, um, it's, it's hard to build some momentum. But if you started doing that in November, December, and you build momentum up, then you're not as frustrated. You you see that the, the strength in that. And so the, the going back to the question, what things will I challenge myself with next year? Every year I take a little bit of time off. And part of the reason I do these, you know, best of the of is because I don't want to record podcasts in December. That's time for me to kind of step away, think about what I want to try for the next year. This podcast started out of this. My blog started out of this. Uh, different things I do 
personally, whether it's running a marathon, whether it's, you know, really trying to revamp my health, I always try to look back and figure out what's something new I want to try this year. So maybe for you, it's a, a blog. I really, I know I'm like old school with this. I think blogging is so underutilized. Uh, Chris Kennedy, a good friend of mine, someone I really look up to, superintendent of West Vancouver, he's been blogging forever. And I, I know him and I are the ones that have kind of kept, kept up with consistently. And I know I learn a ton from him, but I also, he learns a ton from himself, which is the point. Having to write and share your ideas with an audience really makes you think differently about them. And so like, where are you going to put yourself out there? What are you going to try? And maybe don't even think about education. What do you do personally? Maybe it is, you know, getting back on track and the, you know, I'm re-listening to James Clear's Atomic Habits and I'm really proud because I, I think I've really embedded and live uh, Atomic Habits. Don't think about, hey, I'm going to run this race or I'm going to enter this competition. I, I signed up for the Orlando Marathon, not for the marathon, but for the training. That, I know that sounds weird. It is, I knew because I've done it before, I know I'm like, hey, how am I gonna get better from this process? What am I gonna learn from the system? And the race is just a, a, you know, a, a byproduct of that. So when you're thinking about the challenge you have, what are some of the new habits and systems that you're gonna create for yourself that could lead to goals? But if you're just saying, I'm gonna you know, make X amount of money, sure. But what are you gonna do differently that's gonna be continuous and continue on? You know, I wanna achieve this thing. What are you gonna do continuously? What's gonna be part of that process? Because I think when you we have those challenges, uh, I can't remember. It's I think it was Gretchen Rubin uh, shared about this the the arrival fallacy, that idea of uh, basically we will find happiness once we get once we achieve a certain thing, once we get that job, once we get that opportunity, once we hit a certain weight. And the reality of it is, it doesn't happen that way. It's really we find happiness and growth. And so really thinking about those challenges and P.S. I remember the rival fallacy because I blogged about it and I did a podcast on the happiness project with Getchen Rubin. One of the reasons I blog, one of the reasons I do this podcast is because once I share it with the world, it kind of gets stuck in my brain. I don't know why, it just does. And so the last one, how all these answers impact the learners they serve. Now, I kind of like struggled with this question a little bit. I looked at it before, obviously, I started recording this podcast, but... <laughs> And it's not because I, you know, obviously a lot of people that listen to this are in education, but I, I think a lot of times we focus so much on how do we help our students? How do we, you know, help the learners in our school? How do we help our teachers? That is all great. That's really important. But don't limit your helpfulness to just your students and just your staff. And weirdly enough, just the people outside of school. How will, the, how will these things help you? How will these things help you? Because I've learned this the hard way. You can help everyone else, but don't leave yourself out because if you leave yourself out, you eventually won't be able to help anybody. And so when you look at these questions, how will this make you better? And when you focus on really improving yourself, I feel that is when we are best able to help others. Not only through our example, I think, sharing some of my process of my, you know, I've had so many people come up to me and say like, Hey, I started doing this because I saw your post on Instagram. And, you, and a lot of times you don't hear that. Sometimes people have to see me somewhere to say like, Hey, I started eating healthier because I, I share this, but they would have never eat started. Well, I shouldn't say they would have never, they probably would have saw someone else and been inspired. You have to be ready for that moment. Um, but a lot of those people that shared that with me probably wouldn't have changed their habits. Um, unless they saw that I was changing my habits, right? It was through the modeling of the behavior that changed something. And so sometimes the best way that we can really serve others is by taking care of ourselves and being the example. Uh, I see my kids, uh, last night my, I was stretching out and my daughter Clea, she did the best push up she's ever done. And you know, little kid push ups where they just kind of do kid push ups. I don't want to describe that, but you know, and she did it. I'm proud. And she wouldn't even be doing that if she doesn't see me doing that too. So sometimes the best way we can help those we serve is by being the model, not by asking them to do things we don't do, but by them seeing the things that we're doing to make our lives better. They in turn do that too. So those four questions, I'll go over them real quick. 
again, what do I do well this year? Uh, where do I need to grow? You can totally interchange those things. Um, the next one is what things do I challenge myself with next year? What are some of the, no, don't think of the big things. Think of the, the everyday things. I think those little things lead to the big things. And then how will all these answers impact the learners I serve, the people I you know care for, and you know myself. So just some questions for you. Was this good? I don't know. I And you know what? If you didn't think it was good, I think it was helpful for me. And that's the point of reflection. We reflect to get better ourselves. And hopefully when I do that, somewhere along the line, someone hears this and thinks differently about themselves. But if they didn't, I think I grew through the process. So maybe I'm modeling myself the answer to the last one. But if you didn't get something from me, I guarantee you're gonna get some something from my wonderful guests. Welcome back to another highlight episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. You're basically not even a week, a full week into school, which I, I love. I'm like, so I love asking about yeah. this. What was the, what was the first like few days? Like what was like, what, how did you feel kind of going through that process? What was that like? And that's what, that's one of the, re, that's one of the biggest reasons I want to interview. I just want to see like, how did it yeah. go? How, how was your first you know, yeah. few days of school? Um, so honestly, they went a lot better than I thought they were. <laughs> <laughs> I tried really hard to make sure that I was prepared for every situation that right. could have possibly came up. And so, I mean, I like over prepped and over planned and I had like 45 different activities just in case something yeah. went wrong. I had something yeah. to fall back on. Um, the first day it was definitely chaos. I mean, kids didn't know where we were going. I didn't know I had recess duty. I didn't know I had to get them from lunch. <laughs> like all of these yeah. things I had no idea. Um, but I figured it out and honestly it went, it went pretty good. Like I think it was the best three days I could have asked for, you know, like yeah. I didn't have any problems. Students seemed to like me, you know, they gave me gifts and everything. So <laughs> <laughs> what? I know you I had... for the first week. There you go. I know. I know. Oh, wait, wait till Christmas time. That's going to be uh, <laughs> another whole other thing. If you're getting gifts the first week, yeah, that, that, it, it, it is, uh, it, it, you know, as you're talking about this, mm -hmm. how, how much I over planned, you know, the, and I'm not saying yeah. you, I am saying, yeah, you totally probably over planned oh, intentionally, yeah. right? And, time, that, yeah. and that, that to me is, um, you, you know, cause you, you don't, you don't know. And the mm -hmm. interesting thing is you could feel, I could feel way more nervousness, obviously mm -hmm. about you with your first week of kids than you are being on my podcast. That's for sure. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. You ask yeah. me no questions about it. You're like, yeah, I'll show up. I'll do whatever you want. <laughs> Um, the, uh, when you, and you're probably cause you're exhausted from, you know, their first week of school yeah. and, uh, just kind of like listening to that, mm -hmm. the thing that, you know, I hear, I know I feel this too, uh, that nervousness of the first week, the first, it will never go away. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And it is weird cause it, it's new kids every year and you always want to yeah. make a really good first impression. And mm -hmm. that's, that's one of the beautiful things about teaching when you have different grades every year, yeah. you always have a, a, an opportunity to make a first impression mm -hmm. over and over yeah. and, and over again. When I ask teachers, like I always do this, like, Hey, like, tell me about your principal. Oh, they're so nice. They let me do whatever I want. <laughs> I'm like, is that a good principle? You know, it, cause it's not, and I, I understand. And there's this, there's this delicate balance of that, you know, like you got to trust me to have some autonomy in the things I'm doing, but I've talked about this a ton. If that leader is not actually helping you grow and get better, then what is the benefit? And like, what do you, what do you, when you hear that, like, what do you think when somebody would say that to you? Cause that kind of throws me off a little bit. I'm like, I don't know if that's really a great principle because you can do whatever you want, but what, what does whatever you want look like, I guess. Oh, see, and, and there you just hit it right at the end for me, George, which mm -hmm. is, I, I think the good leader, co is their friend, co-create, co-design. They're always doing p things with rather than for people. And and so when, when, when people talk about the sort of doing whatever I want, I always wonder, so what is our co-created observable vision of what? teaching and learning looks like in the classroom because then we now have a common lexicon a common language for us to be able to discuss what's happening in the classroom because a good principal and I, I referred to Marty Lewis uh, in our earlier uh, session together mm. 
Marty's gift was also, and I think the number one thing that leaders need to do is to be able to confront and interrogate practice, whether it's our assessment practices, our teaching practices, our leadership practices, our practices with community engagement. Are we willing to actually confront those through the lens of what's the impact that they're having? So when, you know, the idea of having someone allow us do whatever we want I think that's, you know, kind of interesting in the short term, isn't it? But in the long term, as you say, right. it's sort of like walking through the desert after a while. There's no parameters, no walls. We don't actually know where we're going because we don't know where we've been. So I think that idea of creating that common vision with our staff and with teachers really empowers them to start to deal, uh, to, to get into that. I know where I'm at. I know where I've been. And that's the efficacy piece that we're all sort of chasing around like the, by, like the Holy Grail right now. Let's talk about learner-centered innovation. Oh, let's do so that. Why, first of all, because we're looking at some like books that are a little bit older. Yeah. Why did you write it? Like, do you even remember that process? Like what even got you to, you know, make that jump from blogging and then actually putting it into a book that you yeah. kind of can never change <laughs> ever. It's there forever. It's there forever, for sure. Forever. Um, well, I mean, I think I never imagined myself as an author, never in a million years. Yeah. And going through the process with you was super empowering. I loved it. I loved being able to think about how to put these ideas together and the reaction of what people got from Innovator's Mindset really inspired me to think about, you know, I had been getting some reaction from my blogs and when we did iMOOC, you know, and I started thinking about, I have ideas that are similar, but different and going yeah around professional learning, about the things I was learning in classrooms as I was doing this work around the country that I thought, I started to get the confidence that maybe I could write that and maybe it would be helpful and beneficial. And um, it was a longer journey. I remember writing the table of contents and moving it around a hundred different times and kind of tweaking around the edges. And when I finally just started writing it, um, it, it felt like it was, it was something that would be beneficial for educators. Yeah. And you know, it's kind of weird. Cause like I've written several books and I, like, it's still, I still struggle with that term author, like when yeah. people, because it's really you. And I think this is what makes your work so approachable is that it's really you sharing learning right yeah. in that space. And I think both of you kind of that approach, like, Hey, we talk about innovation. This is something we're really passionate about, but we're also not, the experts, the experts are in the classroom. We're just sharing some of our journey right. to hopefully help people uh, uh, along the way. And I think, you know, anyone who's looking to write a book, I think it's really kind of just starting with your learning and it, it makes it a more, much more approachable because it's like, hey, I can, I can take that or I can modify this. I can change this too. And I think that that's kind of that approach, right? Like that, you'd see that. I know you're very responsive to sharing your learning as you go. Well, I think that was a big piece of it. I was like, it was going to be helpful for educators, not because I had all the right answers, mm -hmm. but because I was seeing what was working, what was challenging, what opportunities existed in classrooms and schools and systems around the country. And that learning and being able to see that the themes across those different systems, that's what I thought was going to be something that people could also learn from as I was making sense of not only what was great practice, but what was possible. And especially coming out of this was 2018, when I think the book was published. So a lot of the learning was like 15, 16, 17, when technology and going one to one was starting to become this big deal. And technology alone, we have talked a lot yeah. about this. Yeah. We knew it was not enough. It had to be much more about why are you using the technology? What are your goals and how, how are we going to really make an impact on learners? Well, you know, when you're saying something, you and I, and it's kind of interesting because you're like, you and I have very similar beliefs, mm -hmm. um, but we have, I would say in some spaces, different approaches. Sure. And in, in, and I, I know, I know I, I wrote about this. I know you've helped me with my stuff and I don't know if you remember this, but when I hired, um, when I was a principal, I hired an assistant principal Mm -hmm. who was a little bit of a thorn in my side as a teacher. <laughs> and that was part of the reason I hired her because she would challenge stuff that I would say, but I knew she had the same goals that I did, but she had a different yeah. approach. 
And that's, that's something that really matters to me is that, um, I wanted to hire, I didn't want to hire a second George, right? right? I wanted to hire someone that had a different way would challenge me on some stuff and would help me grow. And, but also would, and weirdly enough, and I'm sure you understand this too, that some of my staff would be more comfortable connecting with her because of how she approached things. And some of them would be more comfortable approaching me and vice versa. I specifically, when I hired a principal, I hired someone probably as different as me than me as possible because I didn't need, I already had me. I don't need two me's. I need someone who, you know, who, what, and she was incredible at data. I, I'm not doing that stuff, right? Whereas, you know, the principal I work for, when I was assistant principal, he was good at that stuff. So is there, you know, I don't, and maybe there's something different in, you know, Florida leadership, or is that something that, you know, people look at? Like, hey, what is the strength of this person in this? Because a lot of people are kind of turned off by, going into admin because they say, well, that's, I have to do those things. I'm like, not, if that's not, if you're not good at them, right. A good principal will put you in a place of strength, not just say, this is the assistant principal's job, whoever gets it. So how do you see that? I, I, no, I agree. I think it, you know, what, what I would look for is just someone who would best, um, and in a sense, compliment me and balance things out. Um, because like, Prime example is oftentimes uh, for principal and assistant principal, when you become a principal, you no longer have bus duty. You have car duty. Right. Bus duty's got the referrals, car duty. I mean, how many times would you get a car duty referral? I mean, that's, you know, that. Right. But but like for me, I don't mind the bus part of it. I don't mind having to ride on a bus if I need to for student behavior or whatever. And just where those strengths are like data it is a strength of mine, but um, if something else needs attention or, you know, if there's something else that I need more, like I have more of a math and science uh, background right. and, but there might be someone that's got more of the, the ELA social studies side of things. And I'd want that kind of balance because again, we always talk about the whole child Well, I'm, I'm looking at the whole school. Right. And how to best balance okay. things out for the support of our staff. And that could even trickle down to like we have instructional coaches. We could have someone, you know, oversee math and someone oversee uh, language arts and be able to tap into the strengths. Um, our county uses the um, uh, the Clifton uh, Strength Finder and right. we have like our top five. And I mean, I'm one that would always want to see even within our like um, PLCs within our grade levels or even within our um you know, leadership team, what are our strengths? What are our top five strengths? And because I, again, that should really balance each other out because everybody, if they're all on one side of things, you're never right. going to, you want that kind of, I'm not going to say conflict, but you want that discussion. You want right. to make sure all sides are considered and you're not going to have that if you <clears throat> hire in a way where it's going to just complement things or do things that you're already good at doing. It's got to right. be that, you know, more of a balance. So that's that. what I would look for. And, and everyone who's listening, um, if you're assistant principal right now, if you're a principal, if you're wanting to go in those roles, I've actually listed, uh, there's a link to an article called Four Attributes of a Great Assistant Principal. I just pulled it up uh, while I was listening to Dan and he, he knocked off some of the things that I talked about um, several years ago. So I'm excited. Uh, if people are interested in reading that, check it out down below. The root word of discipline is discerna, which is a Latin word, which means disciple, to learn and to teach. So what are we modeling and that's good discipleship and what are we teaching in in our processes and i believe that we teach with consequences like there has to be consequences that takes place logical consequences and natural consequences punitive consequences is something where you're disconnecting the consequence to the behavior so true restorative practices with discipline as a teaching tool utilizes consequences as a, a teaching aspect but doesn't remove the behavior from the consequence, which punitive does. So if a kid gets into, let's say, a, a fight into the school, yes, there may be a suspension needed. And I believe in suspensions. I think that sometimes they're utilized for a way to keep the environment safe. And that's something that we need in education. 
But what do we do after that suspension? Because even before the podcast, we talked about, George, you know, uh, the differentiation of even the consequences in homes, right? Like mm-hmm. one family may give this type of consequence. This family may give this consequence. And we don't have control over those things. What we have control over is the school culture and the environment. Mm-hmm. So when that student returns from a suspension, are they doing steps towards making things right with who they impacted? Are they learning a skill gap? You know, what I did at my high school After a student had their second fight, they would go with our counselors for every Tuesday and Thursday for three months in a row. They'd grab their lunch. They would meet with the counselors and work in a small group on aggression replacement training, which is pretty much anger management. So for three months, they would work Tuesday and Thursday with their lunch to build that skill up. And that's a good logical consequence. It wasn't just a suspension. Now you're done. It's a suspension. And now let's see if there's a skill gap. Let's reinforce that skill gap and let's repair any harm that took place at the same time. Yeah. And like the, the idea of like, just like, here's this action, here's this consequence is something that I've always struggled with. And I always always give this analogy to my staff and say, like, think about your speeding, right? And a cop pulls you over and says, do you know why I pulled you over? Well, because I'm speeding. And then, you know, and then all of a sudden the cop writes you a ticket for speeding and like, not having conversation with you or anything and then gives you the ticket and nine times out of 10, what does the person think? Stupid cop, right? Like they're, they're mad at the cop for them doing the wrong thing because it's just like, here's what you did. Here's the issue. And so is there like, I understand that. And I'm not like, that's not something that I'm like, I get that, but that's how I didn't want to be is that you're actually you want person the 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 person that's actually making the the action you know having issue and you know something i really did that was simple um and it was like super easy for me um when i would do this with students when something would go wrong i would just ask the question why are you here today right and i would just ask that question and i would sit and wait and a lot of times the reason i would ask that question is i would say like because this is the thing with with ha- what happens in schools. A lot of times, like I would have some information from a teacher, but the kid wouldn't know what I knew. So sometimes they would tell me way more stuff. I'm like, oh my God, that's like way worse than what we knew, right? Mm-hmm. And then, so then, and so they would tell, and I would sit and wait. Like I would be patient with it. And the first thing I didn't want to do is say, well, I heard you did this and this and this and this because their their focus is more on, how I'm a jerk, how they don't like me, as opposed to like listening to themselves. And so they would go through that process. And then after they would do this, I would say, okay, what would you do if you were me? And you're trying to get them, and I, and you're trying to get them to figure out the pathway forward for themselves. And, and this is like, most teachers know this. A lot of kids are way harder on themselves than the teacher would actually be. And I don't know, like, Valerie, did you see that, you know, kind of in your role as an administrator? Um, like, how did you kind of use some of these practices in the work that you did before you you took over a direct, as director of partnerships? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, you know, one of the things as a teacher, I always um, prided myself in building relationships with kids and building that community in the classroom so students felt safe and students were able to, you know, share and discuss Um, Another thing was, uh, again, in building the relationships with the students and understanding where they were coming from, it was always about teaching them and not just punishing them. Like you said, you know, there's a process. And I know that in the beginning, and I'm sure a lot of new teachers out there can agree, you're trying to fix the problem. And then it becomes more about you and less about them. And so I think when you give them the time to process what's actually happened and, you know, Dr. Belinda George gave me this advice. She said, you know, try and asking the student, do you want to make things better or do you want to make things worse? And when I began asking that question to students, they always chose that they wanted to make things better. And the thing was, was it offered them the, the time to process what happened and They were also able to say, hey, you know, she's not just going to punish me. She's going to figure out what is wrong and then get to we're going to be able to solve that together versus, you know, go to ISS. I don't want to hear it. This is what I saw. This is what I heard and move on. And I think that sometimes we don't give ourselves enough time to do that. We don't give ourselves as teachers. We don't give ourselves as administrators because we have so much going on. 
But um, we definitely get that time back later if we continue to build relationships and go along with um, handling situations, challenging situations, such like that. Well, I, I got to ask you this because this is like an side conversation. Dr. Belinda George, I swear that is Dr. Belinda George, was she's doing like Facebook readings or something yes. like that? Yes. Yeah, I, mean, I actually wrote about her and I think in one of my books. Really? Yeah, she does yeah, Tucked yeah. in Tuesdays. What, yeah. what did you find is like when you transitioned from high school to middle school, what yeah. was like, what was like, was it, what was like one of the biggest changes for you going through that process? So I grew up thinking that it would be high school and I'd be the high school coach and that was it. And yeah. I thought that I could relate to those people. So those kids and I did. However, when I got to middle school, I would always say two things. I would always say that middle school is the last best chance for a kid. And the reason why I say that is, is because if you look at the adolescent developmental structure of a child, they usually go into, let's say, sixth grade, where their moms and dads and their significant others and their guardians want them to still be friends with everybody. So sixth right. grade is I'm friends with everybody. You then get into seventh grade. You start to develop your own identity. You start to say, maybe I like these kids better than those kids, or maybe those kids are bad and mean, and I don't want to sit with them. So you right. start to struggle. And then when you get to eighth grade, you usually have your well-defined friend group, and then there's only infighting with them. But by the time you leave 14 years old, about when you leave eighth grade, you have all those qualities that make you usually who you are, and they're pretty much solidified. So the role of the middle school educator, the role of adults in middle school is to make sure kids always have an adult they can talk to, is to make sure you guide them through the adolescent changes, but it's also to try to instill in them the things like personal responsibility, respect, caring, and all of those pieces and how to work together so that as they get older, that can already be embedded. And then in the high school, you improve upon what you have. Like I never, a lot of times I didn't stress the pure academics of it, although obviously Massachusetts we right. do, but it was more about the connections and the self-identity so that when they leave your school in eighth grade, they have the skills necessary to become individuals who can think, who can act, who can be respectful, and then who can learn along the way because they have those inherent skills already. The last lesson um, I want to share with you, and this is one that I've kind of re-embraced, uh, is, and you know, I used to do this a lot more than uh, I have in, in the past couple of years, but I've started to do it again, is to advocate for yourself. And what do I mean by that? When I first moved to uh, Parkland School Division, that's the last um, school division I worked with on contract for a, a, a long period of time. That's where I became a teacher, or, or I didn't become, that's where I started teaching, and then I became a vice principal and a principal, and I worked in central office. I had a really great time there. There's a lot of great people uh, that I've met, and I'm still connected with uh, through that time. And on my very first day, I remember they had welcomed new teachers. And it was really an incredible experience because when they were welcoming these new teachers, the superintendents were there. And like, not just the superintendent, but there's like associate superintendents, deputy superintendents, all these people. And I really appreciated that because I had spent several years in another school district. I never met the superintendent ever. They would not know me from a hole in the ground. Yet on my very first day at this school division, I met the superintendent and I met all the associate superintendents, which was incredible to me. Um, it was just it tells you something about the culture of that place and, and why it really matters. And so there was one associate superintendent and I kind of got the, the feeling that he was um, doing stuff with technology integration, things like this. And I was on a temporary contract and I remember saying, I, I kind of pulled him aside. I said, hey, can I talk to you for a second? He said, absolutely. I said, hey, I know that you're doing a lot of technology stuff. Just so you know, uh, I actually did a lot of stuff with technology, technology integration in um, my own, my last school district. And if there's any way that I can help you, if there's any uh, services I could provide um, to the school division outside of my role as a teacher, I would love to do that. So please keep me in mind because I would love to kind of help if you need me to volunteer, to lead some sessions, things like that. And I think he was kind of shocked that I would just went on my way and like basically, you know, offered up my time. But I, I, had, I had committed that when I went there that I was going to recreate myself. And I think every time we have a new opportunity, we have an opportunity to recreate who we are, which 
kind of I'm talking about, to be honest with you, as I'm listening to myself share about this. When I moved here, I wanted to say like, what, what am I going to do different here that's going to create new opportunities for me that I wasn't doing in my last place? It's not about you just show up and all of a sudden you, you always do the same thing, but opportunities start hitting you. You have to rebuild and recreate yourself. And I, I did that and immediately, probably within a week, he had contacted me about something that they were wanting to do. And he said, he asked my advice, would I be able to lead it? And that initiative that I took to advocate for myself opened up doors so quickly in that space that I went from going there as kind of like, I'm going to give teaching one more year because I'm, I'm kind of sick of this to I became an assistant principal I, by the end of the year principal within two years and then central office after that because I was willing to put myself out there now in the last few years I I don't know what it is but I've I've kind of you know I I'm proud of the work that I've done but I kind of just you know just assumed people know but I've been more comfortable saying like hey you know I'm really proud of the work that I do I'd love to work with your district I'd love to do this and I've noticed that once I started doing that um, a lot more opportunities started opening up for me. And it wasn't that I'm saying I'm the best, <laughs> everyone else is worse than me or like that. But I think sometimes um, we just assume people know our strengths, our passions, the gifts that we can bring. And then they don't call on us. And it's like, sometimes you got to put the idea in your head. And I know this, that um, not everyone will advocate for you. Some people will, some people won't. But I think you, we always have to learn to advocate for ourselves. This is something that, you know, some adults get really weird about, and that's fine. Get weird about it. I don't care. <laughs> I really don't care. Because if you get weird about it, would you get weird about saying that to my daughter? Because if you, if, you, if you would, I don't want you around my kid. I don't want you saying, no, 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 like just cower and, you know, hope for the best. I watch educators do this all the time, telling their kids they need to, you know, champion themselves and be an advocate and share their voice of the world. But then I watch a lot of those same educators complain when adults do that. And what, once we hit a certain age, we, sh we shouldn't do that anymore. And so I've, I, I just kind of, you know, when I say don't care, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I, I don't care. Because I think part of it is the reason I kind of maybe you know, pull back a little bit. It was because I was so concerned about people that were crapping on people and like, oh, you're so self-promotional and not to me, but to other people. And then a lot of times uh, other people see that and then they, they lessen themselves because they're so scared of being criticized. They're so scared of doing that. And here's the deal. People will criticize you if you're doing great things. That will happen because, not necessarily because, they have a valid criticism, but sometimes it makes them feel insecure. And I've seen this with teachers. I've, I've worked with teachers who have said this to me. I'm a little bit nervous about trying this new thing because if it works, it's going to make the teacher across the hall feel bad. And I'm like, who cares? If you're helping kids, if you're doing something great, do not hold yourself back because you're, you're worried it's going to make someone else feel insecure. It is more on them to elevate themselves than it is on you to lower your, your self expectations. That to me is really important. We do this all the time. And so I've just kind of said, Hey, I'm going to advocate for myself. I believe in the work that I do. I believe in myself. And it's not that I don't have faults. Of course I do just like everyone else, but we share the same thing with our kids. We share the same things with the people that we appreciate. So we have to share that with ourselves. So, 